started. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Katherine Murphy, and I serve as the science coordinator for the Middle Rio Grande Endangered Species Collaborative Program here in Albuquerque. Um, I'd like to thank each of you for taking the time to attend the next presentation in our collaborative seminar series. And we're very pleased to welcome back Dr. Rob Dudley. Um, he's with the American Southwest Ichthyological Researchers, um, as well as the UNM uh, Museum of Southwestern Biology. Um, among Rob's diverse duties and research interests, uh, he devotes a substantial amount of energy to population and reproductive modeling of the endangered uh, Rio Grande silvery minnow. And therefore, his findings and insights are integral not only to the collaborative program's work, but also to the conservation and recovery efforts of our signatories, as well as the greater research community. Um, so as Rob presents his analysis of our GSM population monitoring uh, during 2021, this morning, I encourage each of you to submit any questions you may have using uh, our chat feature on Zoom, or you can wait and raise your hand at the end of the seminar um, to pose your question during the Q&A session. So um, as with all of our other seminars in this series, we'll be recording it and posting it to our program portal for, for uh, easy access for everyone if you're unable to watch this morning. So with that, I'm happy to turn things over to Rob. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Catherine, so much for the introduction. and. Uh, the opportunity to share our results today with everyone. Um, so exciting being here. I wish I could see you guys in person, but um, this is the next best thing. And I'm just kind of going through the list of names here. Uh, I see a lot of familiar names and some unfamiliar names too. So um, we'll kind of keep it general in the beginning and then dive into the specifics uh, later on, just so you get kind of an overview of the project, how it's changed over time and, and the recent findings. So as Catherine mentioned, it's 1993 through 2021. This is a long-term ecological monitoring project on the Rio Grande. So I'll kind of kick into the slides here now. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank my uh, co-authors, uh, Steve Platania, also of ACER and UNM, um, and uh, Dr. Gary White, um, with ACER and Colorado State University. Uh, so here's the star of the story here, uh, Rio Grande Silvery Minnow, uh, described in the mid 1800s um, during the Pacific Coast Railroad surveys um, and then listed as federally endangered in 1994. Native distribution, well, it was found with these other species shown at the bottom of the slide here. Um, and they were throughout these, this really large basin, the Rio Grande Basin, which includes the Rio Grande um, and the Pecos. Um, and subsequent to, uh, well, mid 19th century um, and later, there was a substantial rain contraction. Uh, silvery minnow now found um, just within what we call the middle Rio Grande here in New Mexico. There's also an experimental. Um, uh, population down in uh, Big Bend area of Texas. And incidentally, a lot of these other species that uh, used to be here are not. Um, so silvery minnow uh, has this unique life history and it shares some traits with these other fish in this guild. Um, they have drifting eggs. Um, and the only one that's left in New Mexico in the Rio Grande portion is um, Hibernathus amorous. Uh, so here's our study area. So it's bounded by the top of the uh, Cochiti Dam, and then the bottom is Elephant Butte Reservoir, um, and then the middle, we call these the different reaches, and they're delineated by these diversion dams. So it's a fragmented system um, here at the top. So this is kind of the start of uh, critical habitat for silvery minnow. Um, moving down, here's Angostura. Um, and of course, these diversions then uh, take water for irrigation um, purposes um, and uh, moving downstream to Santa Acacia. So river flows upstream and downstream of these diversions can be uh, quite different uh, depending on the water needs um, throughout the year. Uh, and then lastly is Elephant Butte Reservoir. 
Um, it's just kind of interesting um, as the sediments move into the reservoir. So it's highly turbid. Um, and then it gets really clear um, as the water moves through and the sediments drop out. So you kind of have this effect at the top too, um, up at Cochiti, um, these hypolimnetic cold, low sediment water areas um, at the top of this, uh, this reach. Um, and things have changed considerably given uh, the regulation of flows from these large uh, dams and reservoirs. Um, here's a photo at Santa Acacia looking upstream 1952 um, and considerably uh, wide braided river channel. Um, you can imagine a lot of low velocity areas that little fish might like to get into. Um, certainly drifting fish eggs could get back into these little areas and hatch out and um, it's, it's fantastic habitat. Um, Things have changed, of course, since uh, the Cochiti went in the 70s. Um, and there's a substantial contraction throughout um, most of the Rio Grande. So a lot of um, incision of the uh, channel, um, which reduces the habitats. Sampling sites. So these have been consistent since more or less since 1993. There's been a few subs, um, but there's 20 total. And they're distributed throughout the reaches as shown here. Um, there's been additional sites added recently, as of 2017. Um, and what this did was it gave a balance to each reach. So we have then twice a year, uh, April and October, sampling uh, 10 uh, sites within each reach. Uh, and then we have some replacements too. So for each 10 that we have in the reaches for this intensive monitoring that we do, on um, the spring, the fall. So we also do just regular monitoring um, between uh, May and September, but that's just at the regular uh, 20 sites. Um, but this basket of replacement sites is valid throughout the year, um, but we really don't dip into this basket unless the river dries. So if we have um, one of our long-term monitoring sites or one of our additional monitoring sites goes dry, um, we add a replacement. Um, and that's just to see well, if the fish are moved somewhere else, if they move upstream before the drying, are they still low throughout? Uh, and then this is the distribution of habitats that we typically encounter in the simplified form. Um, so showing five here, mostly varying by their spatial location, whether they're next to the shoreline, um, which could be either an island or the main shore. Um, and then the velocity. So we have things like runs and pools that separate these. Um, and then the special category for backwaters, um, which is basically like a pool that's just surrounded by land on each side. Um, and we look into these to see, you know, what, what sort of densities do we have, any differences across habitats. Um, and we want to have a balanced sampling regime, which we have then established and held by for a long period of time. So just quickly, these are the sampling methods. Um, we go into a particular site, like here showing Angostura, um, and we take this uh, distribution of habitat. So it's mostly shoreline runs, uh, a few of these backwaters and pools, some runs um, and shoreline pools. Um, and it's mostly for the adults. That's really what we're sampling for throughout the year, uh, the target of the, of the study. But we also do some larval fish monitoring, um, and we take two larval seine hauls for all months of sampling. Um, except for uh, November, we'll talk about that later, but anything from April through October, um, we're keeping an eye out on these larval fish. And this is all species. Of course, I'll be talking pretty much about silvery minnow today, but um, it's a full uh, river population survey um, for fish. So 20 seine hauls per site um, and everything's standardized. So this has been set for a long period of time. We go to similar habitats across flows. So during really high flows, we're still able to locate shoreline pools, backwaters, et cetera. Um, and uh, the distribution of uh, habitats that we're sampling remains constant as well. So uh, uh, just the hallmark of science, right? Repeatability, um, and that's what we aim for. Uh, things have changed a little bit over time. So this is just a slide illustrating some of the project uh, design evolution, if you will, um, over the past few decades. Um, and really what the kind of take home message here is that uh, over time, there's been various groups um, uh, providing feedback or reviews, intensive workshops and things like that, um, that have changed the monitoring a little bit, but not very much. 
Um, mostly it's intensified the monitoring. Um, it used to be quarterly and now it's monthly through a targeted portion of the year um, because they're such a short-lived fish. Um, to do the quarterly monitoring um, uh, was in the early days of the study, um, you know, we'd go out in June or something like that and no one would know what's happening till October. Um, and so now the monthly kind of provides those snapshots in real time in terms of, especially if it's in crisis mode, um, where we're losing water um, and we need uh, real time information on uh, the fish that are out there and also to kind of guide uh, stocking efforts as well. Uh, so the population monitoring uh, is long term, but in the middle section, you know, this is showing 2008 to 11. Um, there is interest in looking at a much more intensive way to monitor population as a population estimate. Um, so just quickly, it's completely different methodology, um, but more or less kind of trying to do the same thing. So, you know, it went out in October, we did 20 sites, they're standardized. Um, but then there's the differences, everything was randomized, including the sites and the meso habitats, everything was mapped um, using, uh, you know, the GIS technology. Um, and then we electrofish removed all fish within habitats, so we had full closure. Um, but despite all these differences in the methodologies, the results were very similar. Um, and this is just showing, you, know, you have to kind of check out the y-axis on these, they're completely different. Um, but the trends were nearly identical, very similar. Um, and so this gave people a little bit of comfort. It was subsequently dropped in 2012. Um, it certainly provides the most robust way that you can measure a uh, population. It's also about 10 times more resource intensive um, in terms of personnel and things like that. Um, but it does get you uh, the gold standard of, uh, of uh, numbers. Um, kind of contrasting that with something we'll talk about a little bit later. So this is an ongoing portion of the study, um, occupancy. And the trends are similar here, but completely different methodologies like I showed over here. Um, the sampling's done in November, um, but it's very intensive. So uh, it happens four times. So we go out four times in a row in November and monitor the site. And it gives us basically, um, a more robust way to measure some key metrics uh, of the population, their conservation status. So here we have occupancy probability. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and that's just uh, how many sites are they located in? So these are, these are different metrics here, but it's showing a similar trend um, that they went down uh, from this 08 to 11 time period. Um, so here's our general objectives of the study. Um, we won't belabor these because we'll kind of talk about them more as we go through um, the different slides. But you know, essentially, we're looking at um, the density of silver. You know, that's the main thing that we're interested in. Um, we're looking at the ecology, so we want to know how does the environmental um, affect these fish populations. Um, and then we have these targeted interests in meso habitats. Also looking at um, you know this uh, intensive November sampling. Um, that we'll talk about later, and then also the site occupancy. Um, so if you think of silvery minnow, you just kind of think of it as a clock. Um, so here's we're going around the circle um, as one year, starting in January and ending December, and really everything's happening from April through October, hence uh, the targeting of our sampling. Um, and that's when you have a lot of things going on with water. Um, irrigation withdrawals, you have spring runoff, you have floodplain inundation, um, and then you've got things like the recession of flow, um, monsoonal patterns, intermittency, a lot going on. Um, and the silvery minnows tying to this period. Um, so they go from egg through juvenile um, within that short period of time. And then really unlike many other species, they're ready to go again by the next year. So they're, you know, they're, they're an egg. They do the circle around the clock here. And then by the next year in April, they're ready to spawn. Um, and subsequently, not many of them live after that. Um, certainly some do, um, and then make it for another round, um, but, uh, but not as many. So it's really a year to year phenomenon. Um, and it's time so much with the spring runoff. So that's the story. Um, you can see here just this uh, pattern over time 
um, looking at over 100 years of data here on this slide, um, but the, uh, the classics, snowmelt runoff, the peak flows, um, the floodplain activation, and then the recession. And then the monsoons are just, they're just weird. Uh, they're just different every year. Of course, this year is just crazy. Um, so, so what's happened? The last couple of years, um, 2020, 2021. So 2020, which we talked about last year, um, terrible um, in so many ways. Uh, <laughs> flows and COVID and everything else. Um, but there's really low flows uh, during uh, the spring and summer. And that was just bad news for Silver Even Minnow um, because they're so tied into the spring runoff. Uh, and then the things changed in 2021. So we had a little bit of spring runoff here. It wasn't as great as historical. That would be the green shown here, um, but pretty good uh, considering the, the prior year. Um, so what did we find? We found larval fish um, in you know, pretty much like we usually do in uh, June, they spike and then they're, they're kind of gone. Um, and so what that means is they basically graduated into the next year. Um, so these are our small mesh seines that we use to catch the juveniles. Um, and we use those fine mesh for the, uh, for the larval fish. Um, and so here's what we found moving through the year in different reaches. Um, you know, they start showing up in July um, in pretty decent numbers. Uh, and, and they made it, you know, they made it through the year. So these are the age zero fish. So these guys would have been um, uh, spawned in, you know, May, uh, and then we caught them here in, in October. So they're kind of the recruitment class for that year. Um, and then we look at all ages. So these are the ones that made it through from the prior year. Um, those would be in the light uh, blue or the aqua color. And you see they kind of, they're there in the beginning of the year, and then they kind of get swamped out. Um, and then they kind of fade off towards uh, the end of the year. Um, and we also have little red bars here, and these are the stock fish. And that's usually the same for them. They're kind of there in the beginning of the year, um, and then they fade off again. Um, the survivorship's just not terribly great um, for those guys through the summer. So really depending on these fish that are spawned each year. Um, and you can see that even more dramatically when we step back in time to 2020, what happened. Well, 2020 was coming off a fantastic year, which was 2019. So those fish went in strong. So these are all the prior year's fish in 2020. Um, and they made it through and they're kind of dwindling out. But, you know, there were so many of them that they were still there. And it was just terrible for recruitment. But, you know, um, we kind of limped through 2020 and made it with OK October numbers. And then it's interesting because we ended up with almost the same numbers of fish in October in 2021. Um, but for completely different reasons. You know, so this was because we had a pretty good um, recruitment here in July or decent anyway. Um, and 2020 is just because we had so many fish from the prior year. So moving forward, so I'm really excited to share this with you. It's the latest data. Um, the rest of the talk, we're gonna be mostly talking about the intense statistical analysis we do on the 2021 data, but I can share this with you um, just because it's hot off the press and uh, makes it a little more exciting since it's already August <laughs> of the next year. Um, but uh, so what's happened this year? Um, well, we had a spring runoff um, and it was pretty good. And there's just a little difference though, if you really look at these graphs and it's the alignment it doesn't really match up very well with the historical mean. So it does, pretty well in 2021. Um, you can see the blue under the green here, but 2022, it's a notable shift to the left. So this is just things I've been thinking about lately. Um, we'll kind of develop this more as we think more and more about what happens in 2022, because it hasn't unfolded yet. We don't know what we're gonna catch in October, um, but just a little clue, um, it's early <laughs> and that could have some implications. Um, and we're kind of already seeing this. So 2021, boom, this is exactly what we'd expect. We go in with few fish um, from the prior year. We have a good recruitment. The numbers pop up and then they go back down. Not really happening this year. Um, and what we're seeing is, you know, we're coming in with the fish from the prior year, doing okay. And then July, that's our most recent data. We should be up here somewhere. 
um, and we're not. So this doesn't bode well for October. Um, so just kind of a, a heads up there. Um, it all depends on survivorship too, uh, you know, through the summer. Um, recruitment is definitely over. Uh, you know, they, they really, they just, they kind of show up uh, in June, July. It's kind of the story's over. And we're getting a lot of monsoon rains right now, but these just, these fish just don't add up to anything um, by the fall, even if there's just a few eggs being spawned um, later, like in July or something. Um, okay, so let's dig into it. So here's the raw data, um, kind of in a, just a pictorial sense. Um, so this isn't uh, real data, it's kind of schematic. Um, but, you know, when you do statistics, you want to have certain things. You want a normal data, you want to have things that are not zero inflated, they don't want to be, you know, your variances need to be homogenous, all this stuff you kind of learn about in one-on-one statistics. And that's the green. So you want something like that, the bell curve. But we have something like the blue, which is completely the opposite, which gives us a lot of problems with our analysis, um, but actually opens up some opportunities too. So I'll talk about that. And I, Kind of dig into the weeds a little bit here just because we're going to use some terms that are maybe not familiar um most certain weren't familiar to me before we started this analysis um but so i'll kind of walk you through it so this mixture model gives us kind of a solution to this problem of the data being kind of crazy um so what we do is we break the data set up into little chunks um, one chunk are the zeros and the ones so that's over here the presence and the absence so were they there or weren't they there? So we can break our entire data set up into the zeros and the ones. And that gives us this beautiful thing, um, which is a logistic model, which is based off the binomial distribution. Um, and we're going to be just calling that delta. So just keep an eye on this little delta sign. Um, and, uh, and the other component is mu. Um, and that's for the density. And so, so now we've suddenly got our bell curve back. Um, and the reason it works so well is because um, we're taking this log normal model, but we're only using the data that are non-zeros. So it turns out if we take the zeros out of the data set and we log transform it, ta-da, we've got a pretty nice distribution and we can use this other um, form. So we've got two things that we'll talk about, delta and mu. And here they are. So over the years, um, they kind of go up and more or less together. So usually when they're doing really well, they're gonna be in multiple locations um, and they're gonna, the densities are gonna be higher. But it's not always the case. And you can see in 2021, they kind of went opposite direction. So what that's telling you is Delta went up a little bit in 2021 and Mu went down a little bit in 2021. So they're kind of doing a little different things um, in certain years. Um, and what it allows us to do is look at two different things independently. So looking at things like the occupancy um, or the occurrence, I should say, um, of the fish. And so a delta of you know, 0.5 means they were about at half the sites that we, that we sampled. And then the mu down here of 0.2 just means that our densities were not very great um, in, in 2021. Um, and uh, mu's also, of course, on log scale. So these things are like orders of magnitude different. Um, across years. So you look back somewhere here, like in um, 2005 was a stellar year um, for spring runoff, tons of fish. Um, and it's just completely different. They were just everywhere and there were tons of them everywhere. Um, and so this is how we put it back together to estimate our densities. Um, you don't need to memorize this. It won't be on the test. Um, but, uh, you know, here's our delta. <laughs> Um, and here's our mu and another little symbol here is sigma. So basically it's a pretty simple formula. We just kind of put these things back together and we can come up with density. Um, you know, so what I'm saying is we're breaking this, this distributions apart and now we're kind of putting them back together because ultimately we want to know is how many fish are there um, per square meter. And that gives us this, this EX. And then the cool thing is then we can estimate um, the confidence intervals shown below here. So that gives us some, you know, kind of, yeah, what's going on between the years and how comfortable we are we saying that there's a difference. So across the years, we can see that there are actually pretty substantial differences um, across years, um, across many years. So compare like 2019 versus 2020 or 2021, there's a decline there. And then we would say for 2021, that's a significant decline compared to 2019. Um, but between the two, 2020 and 
2021, not, not a big change really. Um, and this just kind of puts it in perspective. Um, it helps, yeah, I think everyone kind of think about it in terms of just uh, what are we talking about with these numbers? Um, but you know, down here at the bottom of this figure, we literally can't go any lower. Uh, we can't estimate anything lower because this is one fish per 400 hauls is what this uh, bottom line represents. Um, that's what we do. We go out 20 times and take 20 um, hauls. So we can't go any lower than that. This other, this top, um, you know, we're in 2005, that's just the best. Um, and that's showing, you know, we were <laughs> averaging something insane, 25 fish per haul, taking 400 hauls. So that's orders of magnitude for you. Um, so these things are jumping up and down over years. Um, and it really lines well with the hydrology. So when you line it up here, if you, you know, if you're just kind of doing a general talk, um, it's over. I mean, just look at this figure and that's it. I mean, you can get this in a nutshell. These things, they do really well when we have a lot of flow in the spring and they do really poorly when we don't have a lot of flow in the spring. Now we'll dig into it and kind of get more sciencey, but um, that's the take home message. Um, so we've got Delta and Mu. So they're going up and down, like I said, and here they are overlapped with the water. So they're doing things a little differently across years. And that gives us kind of this cool way to analyze things um, using these models that we can incorporate these covariates into um, that represent flow. Um, so here it is. Um, it's kind of the outline of what we're doing. Um, and we use pretty established uh, generalized linear models, um, looking at these two uh, population metrics versus our environmental covariates. So that's classic ecology. We're looking at how the environment is affecting our populations. Um, and the covariates themselves represent a range of conditions, um, spring runoff, and then also summer low flow. Um, and then we add to these some fancy stuff, um, you know, these random uh, effects. Basically what that does, so fixed effects just means, you know, we're just looking at it just the way it is. So we're just taking it for its, uh, as uh, face value. Uh, the random effects allow us to add a little bit of wiggle around those, those values, those covariate values to say, we're not really 100% sure about anything um, and we never are. Um, and so certainly with uh, a USGS um, flow metric from a particular gauge that we're saying is affecting the entire population, we could add a little bit of wiggle there. Um, and then we just evaluate them using classic um, methods, log likelihood and AIC. Um, so, but here's kind of a general visual representation of just the data um, and the red dots are 2021. So keep those, so you can see, you know, keep in mind we're kind of, kind of on the lower side here with our, our currents um, 2021. Um, and we're also on the lower side of all of these flow metrics. So, you know, maximum flow wasn't hot. We didn't really have any inundation, um, but we did have a lot of low flow days. So they're kind of showing up over here more. So we've got these positive relationships with the high flow and negative relationships with the low flow. Um, here's what low flow looks like in different areas. So of course we get river drying, um, uh, fish isolation um, in pools and maybe habitat um, water quality degradation. Uh, and of course we also get fish kills um, in certain uh, sections of the river. Uh, 2022 is gonna be interesting because we had so much um, uh, drying periodically uh, more severe than we've had um, in past years as well so but uh, uh, here we are looking at then the kind of the opposite effect so this would be the uh, the abundance um, so what do the abundance do so abundance is really low compared to all these other years you can see with the red in 2021 um, but then we've had some stellar years and so there's years like 2005 they're going to be up over here somewhere so tons of inundation lots of flow it's just lasting for months on end um, and not much drying. Um, so not many days of extended drawings. This is kind of a, a proxy for um, river drying, things like that. So once you have a lot of days with a lot of, with low flows, you're more likely to have a lot more problems. Um, and that's what this um, is indicating. Um, so 
uh, yeah, so this muse, this is just showing kind of our spring runoff kind of shows the opposite um, effect where you just have boom populations when you have great habitat. Um, and so here's our uh, final results. Um, you know, basically it's just like one of those tables that'll make you go to sleep, but just look at the top here. Um, tons of weight, that's the important thing. A lot of weight with these models. So there's 400 of these things that we evaluated and three of them get almost all the weight like you know, we're we're up in here into the uh, into the nineties with the top three, and they're all things that are weighted on these key metrics for spring. And what this is telling us is that these spring flows are incredibly important for um, for fish, uh, the boom part of that fish response. Um, the delta doesn't show up as much. We just kind of end up with our global model here. Um, but we wouldn't expect it to show up as much either. So sometimes I think people get confused on these models saying, oh, well, this is all we need to worry about. Um, but the, the delta is, is, uh, is actually quite important because that's the occurrence of fish. And it turns out the occurrence, and we'll talk about this more later, um, is more tied to low flows. Um, so when you start, and it kind of makes sense, when you start losing uh, habitats across reaches and things like that, you start actually losing fish from sites. Um, uh, and so, okay, so here's the kind of trends over time um, with the dry sites taken out. We don't really find that that really makes any difference. Um, so that's our classic uh, uh, blue dots going up and down and then the dry site um, comparison are the red diamonds and they're just an overlap of the two. Basically, if things are doing poorly, they're, <laughs> they're just doing poorly everywhere. Um, additional sites, um, haven't really made too much difference um, for the trends are still the same. So we're showing, you know, differences across years. Um, but the thing is, since we have more data um, when we're doing 30 sites, we're able to tease these things out a little bit more um, because we have a higher precision on these values. So you can see just the red, compare that to 2019 and 2020 something I was talking about before. So these are actually significantly different now and same thing with 2019 and 2021. So these bars are just uh, a little bit tighter, um, uh, which gives a little more confidence in the, the overall results. So I'm just gonna kind of fly through these because they kind of show the same thing, but it's um, using our meso habitat data. So basically you see the trends, you know, they're going up and down. Um, things are really bad in 2012 through 14. Um, they get a little bit better and then they go back down again. Um, and it's just more spotty because we're looking at it across habitats. But the thing that you see is backwaters, you know, killing it. Um, pools, things like that, they're doing great. Um, runs, not as many for sure. The densities are lower. But the important thing here is the trends are the same um, across time. Um, and that's really important because what it's saying is that even if, you know, with the different habitats that we're sampling, things like that, um, we're getting a pretty good idea of what's going on as long as we keep a balanced sample and don't start changing things like, oh, 2023, we're just going to sample backwaters only. Um, we just keep the same design and uh, we're going to be able to, to track these trends um, really strongly. So that's kind of uh, you know classic long-term ecological monitoring. Um, it's just one of the hallmarks. Um, and this is just showing you know the, the importance of meso habitat. There are these differences um, across meso habitats. Um, and not so much with reach. So we threw this in here as kind of a comparison. Um, so it's much more important across things like pools and runs versus Isleta versus um, Angostura uh, reach, for instance. Um, and then looking at our November data, so this is where we get really intense. We go out those four days, like I was mentioning, um, and we really can drill down into things here um, and do some other cool stuff. Um, but this is just showing the trends. So again, the trends are nearly identical. Um, and we see, lo and behold, if we go out four days on day one, two, three, and four, we're getting the same results. It gives us more confidence to just in that things are working out um, and that we're getting um, strong, robust uh, uh, information back um, across years. Um, and then just quickly showing here, just how um, uh, strong that effect is. So reach now, which we, we threw into the, the meso habitats was, was pretty weak over there, but here it turns out to be the top model. Um, but that's just because occasion is so incredibly weak. It makes no difference if you go out on day two or three, like just zero, like they're just identical. Um, 
uh, which gives us great, um, you know, uh, confidence in the in the data. We go out and do the same thing every day. Even the flows might change a little bit across days, um, but doesn't seem to really make much difference. Um, okay, so here's relative abundance. Now we're kind of looking at other fish species, not just silvery minnow. Um, and most of the time, they don't really dominate the community. They're I don't know if you drew an average down through here, it'd be twenty percent, ten, something like that. Um, they kind of fluctuate around that, but oftentimes um, they're pretty low. And the last few years has been the case too. I mean, they're well below uh, five percent. They might be near one percent um, in 2021, and so they're they're down there the last few years. And you can see there's been periods of time when they're just um, uh, uh, critically low. Um, and just looking at the fish community, so it's not the worst. Um, you know, we would say, well, you know, when they're hitting ten. Um, in the rankings, that's pretty bad because these are the focal taxa that we kind of keep an eye on. Um, and they were like that in 2012, 14. Um, they're still kind of hanging on. There's a few others that are a little bit lower than them. But you also notice that these blue numbers really vary. Um, you got one, so they're like the most abundant fish out there um, versus 10. Um, the other guys don't really do that as much. I mean, look at Red Shiner. They're just, they're great. I mean, they're just having no problems. Um, and other ones like white sucker, yeah, they're just incidentals, you know, we're catching them, there's just not that many. Um, and that's kind of what this analysis on the bottom shows us is that um, overall, there's a high consistency in species ranks over time, the exception being silver minnow. Okay, so let's get to some of the cool stuff um, that I want to kind of show you before we kind of, um, uh, kind of wrap things up. Uh, site occupancy. So this is where we go out um, in November, and we do the same thing every day um, at these habitats. So now we're kind of a little bit more, you know, we're kind of drilling down things a little bit more because we're, we're actually marking the habitats now because we need to go back out on day two, three, and four and be able to do the same thing at the site. Um, and so at these different habitat locations, we'll take out our flags um, and we'll mark them. And so we'll know where to come back the next day. And we've already measured them out um, with our tapes. Um, and we can come back and do the exact same thing the next day. Um, and that gives us an ability then to compare across days um, some things that are uh, really important. So site occupancy, if you're not familiar with it, this is kind of just a quote that I think encapsulates the whole concept. This was one of the first I think it was in one of the ecology papers of McKenzie. So few species are likely to be so evident that they will always be detected when present. Now that's really an interesting thing to think about. Um, and it's actually really true um, across so many different levels, um, particularly when you're thinking of ecological monitoring. So you can think of something like this, the red shiner, which is like, okay, well, that's definitely not on the endangered species list, but we should be catching them all the time. Should be no problem. Well, there's times we go out, we don't catch any. There's times we go out and we don't catch them at multiple sites. Um, and does it mean that they weren't really there? Well, it could mean that they weren't really there. And a lot of times it does. It means they just don't not do well at that site or that year. Uh, but it could mean that they were there, they were just so low abundance that we didn't catch them. So, I mean, this really is targeted for things like um, rare species like silvery minnow when those cases become even more important, where we're never really catching tons. We're often catching low densities. And what would happen if we went out on day two and caught one, but we didn't catch one on days one, three, and four? Well, if we went through and did our monitoring on day one, we'd have no idea that they were there. But if we did this study, we would know that they are there. They're just at really low densities. So it gets us kind of this low end. So in some ways with our regular pot monitoring, we get the low hanging fruit. Um, with this one, we dig down further to see how bad is it in a particular year. Um, so this, this is just kind of that whole idea in a nutshell. Um, and it gives us some cool things that we can, that we can um, estimate um, shown at the bottom here, occupancy. Um, you know, were they there? Um, and then extinction and colonization. So, um, I mean, it doesn't get any cooler than that, um, you know, in terms of being able to uh, think about uh, species, uh, the risk um, to species and how that might be affected by uh, 
by environmental conditions. So our occupancy, so we put a lot more value in this than our delta. So our delta is occurrence um, and our occupancy is occupancy. Um, they're based, so this is very robust way to look at it. So you can see I was saying, you know, our delta was like 0.5. Our occurrence is actually around 0.8 for 2021. And then the other thing you'll notice is things look a little rosier between 2020 and 2021 using site occupancy data. Now, the, the, the numbers of fish were still flat. Um, but what this is indicating is they're doing a little bit better in 2021 than they were in 2020. It's still not stellar. It's not like years like 2019 where you just find them everywhere um, with multiple sampling. It's also nearly, not nearly the dire situation that we had in this sort of area where we want to go backwards to that. Um, and again, just comparing these against flow. Um, and the story is very clear and similar to the POP monitoring um, regular uh, data that we take during October. Um, there's a steady erosion of occupancy over time that just manifested and hit its pinnacle really um, in 2013. And then things recovered and they came back and there's a better consistent flows you know, over, over many years. Um, and then things have weakened a little bit in the last few years um, and they've gone down a little bit, but it's not terrible. And as you can see, um, what we would fully predict is if we had a string of low flow years, like we did between 12 and 14, or if it even went longer, um, you can eventually drive down into these crucially low um, occupancy levels where extinction risks um, go through the roof. Um, so kind of looking at that, you know, this is looking at um, extinction probabilities and colonization probabilities um, over time. And if you just look at the colors, you'll see kind of red versus um, black over time. Um, so in the beginning of the study, like uh, six through nine, they were just found everywhere um, most of the time. So the extinction and the colonization are just going to be low because they're not colonizing new sites that have been lost. And they're not being lost from sites where they were previously. But that begins to change in 2011 and 12. Things start going through the roof, means we're losing them from all the different sites that we're sampling um, over time. But we still have a little bit of colonization, which basically means like, well, maybe they were lost from 15 sites. Um, but then the next year, um, you know, some of those uh, five sites that we found them, they were lost from those. But then lo and behold, they're found in another couple sites here and there. They're just hanging on, basically. So that's kind of the species in balance there. Um, and you can see 2013 is getting pretty bad. Um, and then things improve. So in the last couple of years, um, a little bit better. Our colonization went up considerably between 2020 and 2021. Um, and uh, the reverse for extinction. So a little bit of glimmer of hope there after the gloom and doom. Or not the gloom and doom, but just kind of the status quo between the two shows us a little, things are a little bit better um, going into 2022, which we needed, of course, because 2022 turns out it might be kind of a challenging scenario. So just I've probably said all these things um, throughout, but um, elevated 2019. You know, things are have dramatically declined since those um, that stellar uh, flow year of 2019. Um, and we're finding these classic things. They go up when the flows are great. They go down when the flows are, are low. Um, we're finding trends that are matching. And then for our site occupancy, even though it's been as low as 85% loss um, uh, in, the, in the past, like loss from 85% of their sites, um, we see little signs of improvement in 2021. So it leaves us with, um, Kind of a mixed message, um, but here are some of the implications and potential opportunities. So I always like to leave people with this every year, and I'm hoping that at some point they'll get accomplished. Um, I think we as humans always tend to think small. <laughs> Can we send someone to the moon? Can we restore this river? We have to think really big on these things. Um, and <laughs> with the reality, what can we do? So um, everyone's trying as hard as they can, and we've made progress. Um, and so what should we do in the ideal world? Well, we'd want to bring back those dynamic river flows. Uh, we'd want to reconnect the fragmented reaches. So those areas where we have the diversion dams, we'd have fish freely moving through those areas and then connecting to the floodplain. Um, we can't go back to the historical state 
um, but we can bring back elements. And the question is how many and how dramatically can we bring those back? And more importantly, can we bring those back in time? And we have a little bit of leeway. You know, it's so hard to, to do things with other species, with mammals and things, but fish, it's great. Just put them in a, put them in a tank, breed them, and it gives us a little flexibility there. Um, but, uh, you know, we ultimately have to solve the underlying problems to get them off the list. Um, so we'll, you know, providing, this is kind of interim solutions, you know, spring spawning, summer survival. That's really what we key in on trying to make those as good as possible. And then we need to think big, you know, get them outside of the middle Rio Grande. They need to go elsewhere. Uh, they need to go where they used to be. And we need to try it. We need to try it more. Um, we've tried it in Big Ben. It has not worked very well. Um, saw a report not too long ago. It was, didn't look very good. Um, but, you know, we keep trying, try different areas um, and uh, just see what happens. Um, maybe we'll get lucky in, uh, in a particular area. Um, we certainly have it easier here because we still have a functioning um, uh, river to some extent, believe it or not, go down to El Paso and, um, and you'll see why they're not there. Um, it's a ditch and it's a concrete ditch. Um, and, then, and then the factors. So this is where everyone else comes in. So we're just one, one uh, cog, uh, but uh, many other people are doing just fantastic work across all the different agencies, you know, from the fate, uh, you know, the city level, state, federal, everyone's doing amazing work and it's complementing, uh, helping to try to figure out this puzzle and how to maybe solve it given the constraints and sideboards that we have to kind of deal with. So with that, I'll leave you with um, uh, just some thank yous uh, to the folks that helped make this possible, the people in the field, uh, people that let us on their land, which is really great. Um, and uh, appreciate um, just the uh, feedback from folks on the project itself, including these uh, seminars. Um, and uh, certainly the uh, funding and support of uh, USBR over the years. And with that, uh, let's talk. All right, thank you so much, Rob, that was great. Um, we have several questions that have been posted in the chat, so I'll go ahead and read those off. And then um, after, after I read these, anyone else who has question, you can raise your hand and we'll acknowledge you. Um, so the first question is, how has river water quality affected RGSM populations and has there been any analysis of bioaccumulation of any particular pollutant? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm probably not the best person to answer it necessarily, um, but I can tell you what I know. So um, there have been studies, Kevin Buell is the one that just pops into my head from uh, USGS. I did some water um, contaminant studies, kind of more laboratory looking at different species responses to contaminant levels, and then trying to pair that up with looking at what's going on in the river um, in terms of long-term water quality, in particular contaminant or pollution, uh, it seems spotty to me. I'm not really sure, someone might be able to correct me, but um, even just having this long-term monitoring sets on something as basic as like dissolved oxygen, um, they're just not there uh, to draw on. Um, and certainly when you get into some other more targeted things, it's always such a, it's a tricky thing too, right? Because there's often like these pulses that might occur and you might miss it. So if you're not out there monitoring it, you might have no idea that there's some big problem or that could be affecting the fish population. Certainly from our macro view, we wouldn't be able to pick it up unless we had a fish kill or something like that. And be uh, that has happened on occasion, but it's been because of ash flows in from, no, from Northern fires and things, so. Great, thank you. Okay, um, Casey Ish uh, asks, has there been any discussion of implementing eDNA sampling to supplement, verify, or expand site sampling efforts to create a comparative and potentially more cost-effective data set of RGSM presence at the various sampling locations? Yeah, so this is interesting. So eDNA is really fascinating. And of course, it's just electric, right? When you hear about it, it's just like, wow, this is, could solve all our problems. Um, and I think in some ways it can. Um, I think in the right application, you know, uh, it has enormous potential. Um, so I had the privilege of actually being out with, um, it's just it's strange that this question came up. Um, it was, we were out sampling just a few weeks ago 
And one of the guys in the truck was, uh, uh, he's getting his PhD in genetics. And so I posed the exact question to him. Um, and his response was, yeah, you know, this is, this is amazing. It works great. Um, but really it's present absence. Um, and apparently within the literature, there's a lot of, um, a lot of papers out in the last few years just showing how many problems there are after now people are starting it um, with using it in certain applications. So um, within lakes, you know, presence absence, you go to some cool place in South America or something, um, and you could say, wow, you know, like here's the species in this area or in Northern Mexico, maybe you're wondering if there's like an endangered um, fish there still, or is there some introduced species that's not supposed to be there? Uh, rivers apparently is just, it gets bad. Um, I don't know how bad. And the thing is, I never want to say never because the technology just marches on. Um, but apparently at this stage, it doesn't seem like it's there. Um, and there's some fundamental things where it kind of indicates that it might never be there in certain applications just because of the way genetic material is shed into the environment. And so this is just, um, you know, talking with the fellow last month um, that, you know, at a particular site or a particular month, you know, where did that information come from and how much of it was there and how could you tie that back in particular to a population level at a particular site? Um, it's interesting, though, um, because I'm sure as, uh, as the technology progresses and things get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, um, that you can almost envision a future um, where people could do more and more and they can start accounting for things that we'll say now are impossible um, and in the future might say, oh, well, you know, that was, uh, we can do that. <laughs> I mean, remote sensing is perfect, right? You don't have to be everywhere um, for things. Um, certainly at the moment, you know, that was his takeaway was like, we're, we still need ground truthing on all this stuff for, you know, for a while. Great, okay. Uh, so the next question is, um, so with nearly 20 years of monitoring data, the population might be considered stable. Is there information on threat amelioration that would support these data? Um, so, okay, so the first half of it, the, the population might be stable. Um, yeah, potentially, we always kind of keep our eyes on, you know, what's going on. Um, you know, it's kind of stabilized, I would say, because of the um, augmentation program, um, kind of supplementing fish into the, so it's kind of an artificial stabilization, if you will. Um, so what would happen if you remove that crutch? Um, you know, and particularly when you think about that for things like recovery, um, you know, what happens, you have a self-sustaining population, can they really be self-sustained with these flows? And what would happen if we pulled away all stocking, um, you know, and see kind of, you know, how that manifests. Um, in terms of threats and you know what to do about them, I mean that's a great um, that's a great question. I don't know really. Um, uh, the difficult thing, I think, the most difficult thing with trying to tease out trends and things that you know over time. So we're able to to kind of tie it into these big ticket items, the flow. So yeah, if you could say like we're going to provide. We can guarantee you we're gonna you're gonna we're gonna provide 2,000 CFS every single year for the indefinite <laughs> timeline. I'd say, wow, okay, that's great. Uh, I think you pretty much solved this. Um, but uh, if you can't, then you need to dig beyond other things, and so that's where it gets a little trickier. You know, like if we take away this thread, if we take you know reduce um, uh, incision of the channel, you know, um, if we uh, restore habitats in other ways. How much impact does that have? And that's where I think it gets really difficult to answer some of the targeted questions um, with uh, this uh, data set. It certainly gives a macro view, and I think probably the most important view of the long-term population. Um, but in terms of specific threat reduction, sometimes I think people need to dig in to more targeted studies to get at um, specific uh, answers to questions on those levels. I wholeheartedly agree <laughs> for what it's worth. Um, okay, so Joel Lusk with Reclamation asks, could you characterize the colonization extinction probabilities a bit more? Is that modeling fish population behavior, characterizing probable fish dispersion? Uh, and then he says, 
what makes those metrics colonization extinction change in the model environment? And can one use those probabilities estimated in October for other months? So if we saw 50% occurrence, then we'd expect a certain population trajectory in a month other than October. Okay, yeah, so uh, <laughs> thanks, Joel. That's perfect. Um, yeah, and it's, it's interesting the way these models are um, kind of manifest with the data set that we're throwing at it. So we're not throwing a lot of data at this model. Um, and so that's where you'll see some of these error uh, confidence intervals a little bit uh, larger than we would ideally like to see them. Um, you know, if you did this site occupancy at 50 sites, um, for instance, uh, you know, you get a lot tighter resolution and you wouldn't necessarily have to do what we're doing either. Um, you know, like if people were specifically interested in only site occupancy, you wouldn't go in there and spend all, you know, a couple hours or whatever sampling fish. As soon as you catch one, you're done. They're there. Um, and you give it, uh, you know, maybe uh, a bunch of tries if they're not, but you save yourself a lot of time. I'm trying to do it. So, but site, what site occupancy does and the power of it um, within the modeling environment um, is you're able to estimate, you know, were they really there? That's the question one. And then this, the colonization extinction. So colonization just means, and this is where it's a little bit confusing. Um, so I'll see if I can explain it, hopefully um, in, in a way folks can get. Um, but basically think of, Extinction colonization. So there's, uh, you know, kind of classic island biogeography, um, where you think of all these species on an island, and maybe they're floating in on like a little piece of driftwood, um, and that's your colonization. And over time, things get really bad on the island, and they go extinct. Um, so we kind of think of it as that, um, but on a site level within the river, um, and so all these little sites that kind of comprise like our island space, if you will. Um, and so when we lose them from a particular set of sites, um, our extinction probabilities um, are higher. So it's, for instance, say we had them at 10 sites and we, the next year, we only had them at five sites. And those five sites happen to be the same sites that they were the previous year. Well, we our extinction probability would be fifty percent. This is the confusing part. Is um, you know for the colonization, it gets a little more confusing because the next year the colonization could uh, you know say we were the same thing. We went from uh, ten sites, but now say we went up to fifteen sites the next year. Well, the colonization can happen at a number of different sites. So it could be that we colonize colonized. Um, uh, some new sites, um, or, you know, uh, uh, well, we would only colonize new sites, but it just depends on what was there um, the previous year to be able to compute the actual value. So that's where it gets a little confusing when you have no extinction probability and no colonization probability, because that could either mean they're nowhere and they were nowhere last year, or they're everywhere and they were everywhere last year because it's just a relative comparison across time on the sites that we have. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, does it give us some, I think the idea was, does it give us some insight into, <laughs> I don't remember quite the exact wording of the last part of the question there, 50%. Um, does that give us insight into maybe what's gonna happen next year? Was that kind of the question? Uh, on the different months, how do you characterize could you use that same relationship for different months? So when you're in July looking at those same factors? Oh, that kind right. of thing. Got it. Yep. Yeah. So we could if we did it. So we don't. So the thing is, we only do it once a year. Um, and yeah, certainly we could do something similar in July. We just don't have the data to actually um, estimate those metrics in different months. Um, because it has to be sampled four times to be able to generate those uh, values within the model. Um, so as it is currently, um, uh, for something like July, we would just uh, end up with the regular pot monitoring data. That worked. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying, Joel. Um, 
I wanted to thank Tom Turner. He weighed in on the eDNA question and said that turbidity might be a factor with eDNA in the middle Rio Grande because DNA fragments adhere to clay and other particles. So. Ah, yes. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, interesting. And then uh, I think Grace Haggerty had to drop off. She had another meeting to run to, but she, she uh, submitted a question or a comment here. She said the incidental take statement for the 2016 biological opinion is tied to the population monitoring data. So more precise is better perhaps, especially in these low density years. What would you suggest? Doing additional sampling in low flow years perhaps? Yeah, so that's something that's been toyed around in the past. There was a there's been talk in the past as far as, you know, should there be a really big monitoring effort in, at some point it was either April or October because there was kind of folks on that, but we'll just talk about October in particular because that's where our question's going, you know, like it's been a really bad year. Um, and interestingly enough, <laughs> 2022 is shaping up to be where we start worrying a little bit, like are our 400 same halls enough? Now we'll have more um, because we'll be able to, uh, to add those additional sites in. So, uh, you know, it bumps us up to 600. Um, but what if we go out and do all 600 halls and we don't catch a single silvery minnow? Um, well, it's pretty easy. We just haven't, we don't know if they were there. Um, again, we still have the site occupancy to drop back to in November that um, has never failed. We've always been able to say something at the end of the year, even those terrible years, um, we could still detect them. Um, but it's a good question. In October, and we um, sampled um, say we quadrupled our sampling effort at each site. Um, we've done some studies or some uh, just kind of, you know, uh, book studies in the past to see, you know, what impact that might have. And it seems like, um, you know, you get a great precision at that particular site, but that doesn't really tell you much about the population. Um, so it's almost like you get, um, you get more bang for your buck, so to speak, you know, if you go to, to different sites, so you do more sites versus a really highly intensive sampling at one site, or, you know, like a population estimation, um, you get a really um, uh, accurate uh, measure at a particular site, but you'd have to still probably do multiple sites um, within that area. So that'd be kind of, that's kind of my my feeling on it. Certainly the population estimation has strengths for certain applications, um, but the low flow years probably wouldn't be one of them. I'd say it's almost better during a modest high flow is kind of a calibration. Um, but during the low flow, I think you just really need a lot of sampling um, sites to be able to um, detect fish. Um, you know, because they could just be, you know, patchily distributed um, to some extent. Um, and that could that could certainly help. And it doesn't have to be done every year. So that's what she's also kind of getting at. So the, sometimes these things, you know, um, could be, you know, should we do this thing forever? Um, and it's like, well, no, maybe, you know, when things are looking really bad, then you intensify efforts. That's kind of where this additional came into play. But yeah, that's what I'm going to be thinking, you know, on our 600th Sane Hall of October. I'm like, I hope we caught one by now, because <laughs> otherwise this is it. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. Okay, well, that's all the posted questions. Um, Thomas Archdeacon did uh, post a link to a publication um, for within site effort if people want to delve yes. into that a little bit more. Perfect, they did some great stuff on it, yep. Yep, uh, but we're after 11 o'clock. So um, if no one has any pressing questions that they would like to ask right now, we can, uh, we can conclude the seminar. Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> Okay, well, Rob, I wanna thank you so much for your time and for uh, walking us through this and, and answering some of these questions. Um, uh, we look forward to having you back next year around the same time, if that's all right. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you so much, Catherine. And thanks everyone, sincerely, really, really appreciate the feedback um, through these live sessions. And uh, it gives us things to think about and ponder for the next year. Um, and we love it. So anytime we hear back, you know, comments on reports or, or via forums like this, it's, it's wonderful for us too. So 
And uh, thanks to West, obviously, for facilitating um, with all this with Catherine and Debbie. Just tons of hard work they put into this every year. So, yep, look forward to seeing you guys next year, too. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank